This topic, as you can already read, is going to be locomotion VR. So why do I get to talk about that? As I was already introduced, I work for the uh, TU Graz, and my research is mostly concerned with virtual reality and augmented reality stuff. So today, we're going to talk about how to avoid the following. <laughs> this is really important. <laughs> and so let's first talk about why this actually happens. So there's three main reasons. The first one is a technical reason, that's latency. Uh, so latency deals with if the tracking of the VR headset is like slightly off or too slow, or if the rendering as well is too slow. So the general rule is that your game needs to render 90 frames per second uh, twice, like for left eye and right eye. So that's quite a challenge. Um, then the second thing that can cause you to throw up is that the camera is like slightly off, for example, the field of view, let's like say the Oculus Rift has 110 degrees field of view, but your game camera has 90 degrees. So everything is slightly zoomed in and that feels really wonky, like looking through binoculars. So that doesn't feel great. And the third thing is the disconnect between what you see and what you feel. So your inner ear has a sense of balance and has a sense of uh, inertia or movement. And so uh, if the eyes sees you're moving ahead and the rest of your body feels nothing. Uh, that is akin to seasickness, called VR sickness. Uh, and that will be the main focus of this talk. Bless you. <laughs> uh, so how to mitigate this disconnect between what you see and what you feel. So the one approach would be the hardware approach. You just take a huge treadmill or whatever that thing is uh, and physically simulate the movement. Uh, nice idea, but you need another huge thing it, that, that needs to be supported by uh, the software and you have that huge thing magic standing around. So let's instead look at other approaches that you as a game developer can do within your game. Um, there, these can be broadly categorized into three categories and the first one we're going to dive straight into is how to ease the movement. So this is most similar how to uh, like to sorry, <laughs> traditional games handle the camera. So you just try to mitigate the camera movement a little bit. The most common approach for that is teleporting. And here we see an example in the game Budget Cuts, where you first shoot and then teleport. Uh, can look at where you're gonna go, that's the blue bubble, and then actually go there. Uh, so the great thing in this teleporting approach is it actually adds to the game, because it's a spy game, and so you like sneak around there and can look at the routes of the guards and then just go there. Uh, another teleporting approach is the blink approach. Um, in that one, the screen just goes black for a second. You move to wherever you want to go. Uh, I, in my personal opinion, that's a pretty lazy approach. And it also adds the disorientation because everything was black for a second. Uh, then Valve recently introduced um, the dash teleport, as you see in that GIF. Uh, you just quickly dash forward. So the big advantage there is, if it's quick enough, you don't actually get sick from it because your body doesn't know how to handle that. And you also don't lose your uh, place within the world. So you don't suddenly appear way over there, but you still see you moving there. So you um, keep your sense of scale. And so the last way of adding teleporting that I'm gonna talk about is just actually using physical objects, like throwing a few or something. Uh, that can be used to uh, this great effect in your game if you actually make it meaningful within your game. <coughs> the downsides, though, are it uh, limits your range because you can throw it way over across, and also it limits the precision. Like you see that cube there in the GIF is like bouncing around a little bit, so you don't end up quite where you want to go, but close to it. Uh, so another approach how to handle the whole camera uh, is just third person view. Because uh, initially everyone thought, no, you have to do first person, that's how you get fully immersed. Turns out it's actually not true. Uh, there's a couple of games, like Lucky's Tale and the Adventure Time game, where it's third person, and it works great. I love it. The upside of this is that the character can move quite a fair bit without the camera having to move. So that's how you ease the camera movement. And even if the camera has to move, do it very slowly. Like, even if the character jumps off a cliff, very slowly pan the camera down because the player can just look down anyways and see what's happening down there. 
another approach that works only in certain types of games is the cockpit approach that works great in, as you can see, the racing games or space games. The advantage there is that the player has a, like a um, point of reference, so not everything around it is moving, but you're sitting in this thingy magic and half of the stuff you see around you does, moves with you. So that, for some reason, makes it feel better for some people. For some people it does nothing and they just throw up as well. <laughs> and also an easy approach is you just take away the player agency and put everything on rails. So for example, in this game, you move on this yellow or orange bar and you can just look around. So the designer has full control over how fast the camera moves. Thus, you can just make it slow enough that you don't get sick. But it does limit the player agency. The player can usually just look around. That's almost it. Quite boring. So, there is also more fun stuff. Like, the next, the next couple of approaches are going to mess with your head. It's great. I love that stuff. For example, redirected walking. This means that uh, the actual position and the position in the game are slightly disconnected. So for example, if you're turning your head 90 degrees, in the game it actually moves more. So this way you can all you can make the player go in circles. So here we see an example that's um, the Asymphony, I think. Uh, and the person in the game walked that, but in the real world walked in a circle basically. And they can even make you avoid obstacles and stuff like that uh, by tricking you. Uh, but that has to be very subtle. Uh, translations and moving forward and backward, you immediately feel if that's off. You can't really mess with that. Rotation, you can mess a little bit more, but if you overdo it, again, you get sick. Uh, I tried it out myself. It's tricky. <laughs> uh, then another great thing is, uh, is the change blindness approach, <coughs> where you change the world around the player when he's not looking, or she. So for example, in this example, there's one big room, and when the player enters the hallway, the room switch and the other one gets bigger. And so this way, you also extend the virtual world a little bit, at least, so you can fake a bigger space than your actual tracking space is. But this is rather limited and takes a lot of trickery. Uh, and the third uh, thing is, you don't actually trick the player, but you do it, obviously, uh, with the impossible rooms. So there's this game, I actually just forgot his name, something with espionage, uh, where you see the player walks through, uh, goes through that room, goes left again, and it's a different room. And then goes through that, different room again, and goes left, and it's a different room again. So that way you can create infinite play space, basically, but each room is limited to the size of your tracking, or like half of your tracking space, basically. So this is one possible approach how to enlarge your world in a weird way. So, and the third approach of how to move through the virtual world is to actually um, simulate the movement or that the player actually moves so one example for that is running in place so here we see if you look at the bottom most corner the player has both lap controllers has one stuck out one somewhere here and then you just run in place and apparently that's good enough for our you trick the inner ear of that your body is moving everything is fine and though the body can't tell you're actually moving forward you're just jumping in place so that surprisingly works. Then another approach that works quite well is pulling and climbing. So here we see uh, the climb by Crytek, where your two controllers are the two hands you see in this video. And so you navigate the world by just actually climbing. So the player again stands in place, but does the hand movements? Apparently not. Uh, another example here by Google um, is uh, called Slides and Ladders. So here the player traverses the world by either climbing ladders or, as you see them, wiggle around their controller as well. Thus, that's again enough, feels nice, you don't get sick. Or, as the people in Job Simulator uh, approach the whole problem, they just didn't care about locomotion. So everything, the entire game takes place within your track space, you never leave it. Uh, simple solution. <laughs> But it limits the type of game you want. If you want like a sprawling huge world out of Skyrim or whatever to walk around, it's going to be tricky. So you need to tailor your game to the tracking space. Uh, and so you also can't just simply add that to your existing game. You need to start from scratch to do that. So, and I want to end this with a bunch of important rules you have to follow when developing your own VR game. So the most important one 
never take full control of the camera. You can like move the camera if you want, but never rotate it. Like never force the player to look over there. That's instant vomit. So always at least let the player choose where uh, to look. Um, so another example is don't do soft acceleration because that's what the body is actually that it can ha or does understand. So it knows how to react and can tell that there's a disconnect. So for example, here in Minecraft VR, we released last week, uh, if you press the left and right button, you don't slowly turn left or right, but you snap 22.5 degrees to left or right. That's the sudden uh, snapping movement here. For some reason, that doesn't set it upset the body because it's just so quick, it, it just takes that. Uh, so that's a good example. Uh, what you should avoid is continuous movement. Like in traditional games, you just press forward and slowly move forward, or fastly move forward. Uh, there is this game called Windlands, which uh, is a terrible example, because here you can uh, you pull yourself through the world with these weird hooks, and then you swing, and you can even jump and fall around, and that's terrible. If you look at that in the Oculus Game Store, it says "under comfort intense." Uh, <laughs> And if you read the reviews, it says like, yeah, I couldn't take it. And like, even a positive review was, yeah, I have to set an egg timer for 15 minutes because I can't take it longer than that. Uh, so yeah, discrete movement, <laughs> no continuous stuff. And lastly, also um, give your player a chance to take a break from the full immersion. So for example, in Minecraft VR, you just, uh, that's the full immersion and then you just, zoom out and you're sitting in like a living room and play the game on a tiny screen in front of you basically. Uh, so there is less movement around you and it's, it's just better. Uh, and so the camera the, the, in the living room can't move around. You can still look around but it doesn't move. So that gives you uh, some ease. Uh, there is another approach in uh, Adrift. It's a game where you fly through space. Uh, if you start feeling sick there you can press a button and then everything goes black and you have like this tunnel vision. That also mitigates the problem a little bit. Uh, yeah, and actually, thank you for your attention. I'm almost in time. And uh, if there are any questions, please go ahead now, and then we can all head to lunch. Turns out it is apparently hereditary, so you, you can get used to it. Uh, like it took me a couple of weeks to get used to it, and now I can play Half Life 2, which breaks all the rules I just mentioned for hours, and I don't care. But for example, my boss, who is also a re VR researcher, he's our benchmark because he can't handle more than three minutes of VR. Still, it, it, no matter what we do, he just gets queasy, and that's it. <laughs> so it's, it, it's, it depends on the person. You can get used to it, but apparently some people just never get used to it. So. Bummer for them, I guess. So in most current VR headsets, you have a huge number of cables hanging out the back of your head, which yes. especially in a game where you can walk around are a huge tripping hazard. Surprisingly not. Uh, but we in our company have to rule that you always have to play a conflict by another player. Really? Because I, I also expected that I'm going to trip a lot and I'm never so far. Okay. But sorry. So maybe you're just lucky. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I was wondering what your thoughts on the cable management aspects. Uh, yeah, I don't, I've, as I said, I was really surprised that you always feel where it is. Sometimes you have to like be conscious and turn around to un untwist, basically. But we had many, many people now using our wife, and there has been no <laughs> problem so far. Uh, we just discussed it last week that we were surprised that it doesn't matter. We also actually tried a, um, a wireless approach where we enhanced the Google Cardboard with positional tracking and sent the data via Wi-Fi. But that's not there yet. It's too slow. It's so the latency was too large. It wasn't quite comfortable. More questions? Have you got any tips or tricks for the players? Because I tried out this yeah. once 
and I spent like six hours afterwards feeling very sick. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, what can players do if they don't? Uh, well, um, as I said, if the game offers this break option, you should uh, like it that you somehow limit your field of view. Do that rather early than later, because there is like this point of no return, basically, where afterwards you can, no matter what you do, you're, you're gonna feel sick. So do that often. Uh, also, apparently, looking down helps for some reason. Uh, I only read getting drunk first. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. I haven't tried that yet. <laughs> getting drunk apparently helps. I haven't tried it. But when you're really drunk, doesn't everything move already? <laughs> Oh, okay. <laughs> well, I guess we have some science to do soon. <laughs> uh, also, yeah, I'll just regularly take it off. B because I once experienced when I played those Half-Life for three hours, I had the opposite. I felt really sick when I took it off. <laughs> like the real world, I almost fell off my bike because it was the real world suddenly. <laughs> <laughs> and there was something over there. Something over there. You talked about never moving or rotating the camera for the player. Um, how, what are methods to get players to look where you want them to look? <laughs> uh, there's an interesting talk by some guy at Valve. I forgot his name. But they also dealt with that a lot because in Half-Life 2 they also never take the camera from the player. You can always run around and look wherever you want. So they use like level design to actually make you look at stuff. So in, in Portal 2 there is some portal or some thing you need to see way up there. So they just put a lot of pipes there, leading that way, so you naturally look up there. Or there's, uh, in Half-Life, well, episode 2, there's an example where they want you to look over there, so they just make an airship fly past that, and you usually follow that and then see the thing over there. So that's the way how you get them to look at stuff. Or you can just paint an arrow at that point. <laughs> <laughs> but as I said, never, never take the camera. Like, in my development, sometimes my program crashes, and then you move your head and the picture doesn't move, and that's... Bleh as well, instantly, so. More questions? Okay, so thanks to Lawrence again. Oh, there's one more? No. <laughs> <laughs> but then the Twitch people can't hear you. Oh, they, they can't hear what the... Oh, never mind, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Um, is there a difference between age? So are you guys less um, uh, flexible with age to get used to? Did you find anything? Did you like the boss have problems? And uh, honestly, no idea. I would assume there is a difference that you get easier used to that when you're younger, but I actually I can't give a, a good uh, like a backed up answer to that. It would just be guesswork. Okay. I think I think in, in in the film industry and in movies, people always used to get sick um, before they were really used to that kind of feeling and sensation and stuff like that. There's also, I think, a kind of like getting people to think, yeah, whatever. Yeah, okay. and also, so technology <laughs> is going to get better and better, tracking is going to get better, yes, resolution yes. is going to get better, so it's going to be more comfortable anyways. Okay, um, I don't want, uh, just a few words on the microphone. So again, thanks to Lorenz.